Hey, North Point family, thanks for joining us for our online service this week. We're glad that you've decided to worship with us. Um, let's just stand up right now. I know it's a little uncomfortable. You'd rather be just lounging on your couch, in your PJs, but we want you to be active participants during this time of worship together. So just go ahead and stand up if you can, uh, and then we're going to read together from Psalm 33 together as our call to worship for this morning. Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. For our heart is glad in him because we trust in his holy name. Let your steadfast love, O Lord, be upon us even as we hope in you. During these uncertain times, we can still trust in the Lord that he is in control and that his steadfast love endures forever. And so before we begin uh, to sing. Let's pray together uh, and just steady our hearts on God. Lord, we thank you so much for the reminder that your steadfast love endures forever, that you are trustworthy, uh, that you are in control. Uh, Lord, there's a lot of uncertainty. There's a lot of fear and anxiety. Yet we want to remember and we want to uh, be grounded in the truth of the Bible and of the gospel, of who you are. Lord, you will never leave us nor forsake us. Your presence is with us. Lord, you have saved us and you have given us eternal life. And that is more than enough to hope for and to be joyful over. And so, Lord, we praise you this morning for your salvation, for your grace, and for this life that you have given us through Jesus Christ. And so we lift up our voices and we praise you today. In Christ's name, amen. Sing, I once was dead in sin. I once was dead in sin. Alone. A child of wrath I walked, condemned in darkness. Your mercy brought new life, and in your love and kindness, raised me up with Christ and made me righteous. You have bought me back with the riches of your When I am heartless If ever I forget my true identity Show me who I am and help me to believe My sin has been erased. I'll never be the same. Sing this out. You have brought me back. You have brought me back with the riches of your amazing grace and relentless love. I'm made alive forever with you, life forever by your grace. I'm saved. You have brought me the riches of your amazing grace and relentless love I'm made alive forever with you life forever by 
He's alive. This time we're going to take our offering. And so go ahead and follow the prompt below. Uh, you can give online uh, through your smartphone or wherever. Um, just go ahead and do so during this, during this song. Uh, let me pray for us. God, we thank you so much that you are the resurrected Christ. God, you took all our shame. Lord, you took all of our sin by dying on the cross for our sake. Lord, we thank you for this life that we can have in you. God, we thank you that you are not defeated by death, but you conquered death. And Lord, you give us this resurrection power even now. Lord, in the midst of this darkness, in the midst of so much death and sickness, God, you still reign and you still rule over this world. So, Lord, we trust in you, Lord, and we thank you that you are with us and that you are present. Lord, thank you for the spirit within us. Lord, continue to remind us of who you are and how in control you are and how powerful you are. Give us your peace, give us your joy, and give us your love. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. treasure, Lord, be my reward. Be my holy Jesus, what I'm fighting for. I'd give all my history just to stand at your door, to knock in here and to you're an orphan no more. To knock in here and to you're an orphan no more.
Hey, good morning. I am so excited that you guys are here for another week of online church. I'm Trentel Gordon, and these are your North Wing Hugh highlights. And man, one thing that is absolutely crazy that God is doing, over a thousand people watched last week's sermon. So shout out to you guys as a family, sharing and liking and just telling people about, hey, this is what's going on. I am so excited to see how God is moving in this crazy time of social distancing and quarantine and this pandemic. But hey, Jesus is moving and that is proof. So thank you guys. Hey, make sure you guys hop over to the website. Make sure every week that you guys get a chance to check out the worship guide. It's packed with a bunch of good stuff to maximize your experience at home with sermon discussions, a giving link, prayer requests, and also kid Bible lessons that are print off to stop your kids from rolling all over the place. Man, next week is Easter. He is risen. And boy, am I excited. We all know we won't be able to meet together. That's kind of sad. But in this season of quarantine and social distancing, we will be putting a lot of things on social media. But something that I am really excited about is something for us to be personal as a church family. So what I'm gonna need you guys to do is grab your phones, okay? Grab your phones, and in 15 seconds or less, I need you guys to answer this one question. How has God been working in your family's lives, in your own lives? How have you seen that play out? Do that in 15 seconds or less and send that to Jared Harms. Link is below by Wednesday at noon. We want every single one of you guys to submit a video because of this time of not being able to gather the church family. This gives us the opportunity for us to encourage one another, build one, one another up, and share how God has been working in our lives this week. So please submit a video of you and your family and how God has been working. Andy's gonna come up. We're gonna take a brief pause in our Roman series and we're gonna take two weeks to look at how we can find purpose in light of Easter. Please turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 19. Hey, as Trentel mentioned, we're gonna take a break from our Roman series and think about the coming Easter holiday. Now, Easter is not gonna be what it usually is because of the unique and unprecedented times we're in, but we still wanna think about it and celebrate it. With that in mind, uh, let me talk a little baseball strategy with you. The goal of any baseball team is to score runs. Now, they have all kinds of strategies. They have a a sacrifice bunt where you just hit the ball a little bit so the guy can advance a base. And there's a a hit and run where you send the guy to steal and you try and hit the ball where the the guy was covering. And and then there's a, a pinch hitter. When you get in a crucial situation, you bring one of your best players off the bench to replace the weaker player. And and these are all strategies to try and score more runs. But at the end of the day, when the manager is being evaluated on his offense, the question is, how many runs did you score? That's the purpose. We need you to score runs. And if you say, well, yeah, we didn't score many runs, but we really had a high success rate in our sacrifice funds. And our pinch hitters, they hit really well. They, were, they hit 443. And I, it doesn't matter. How many runs did you score? That's the purpose. Well, I point that out because these are unprecedented times. And and the things that we've done as a church in meeting together in small groups and women's ministry and men's ministry, they look different. But our purpose has not changed. And I think that purpose comes into fuller light in light of the fact that next Sunday is Easter. So I think it's worth us thinking about what purpose does Jesus have for us as a church? So if you've got a Bible, if you would open that to Luke chapter 19, we're going to start in verse 1, and we're going to go to verse 10, asking this question. What is Jesus' purpose for us, individually and corporately? Luke 19, verses 1 through 10. Our passage opens with Jesus on his way to Jerusalem to die to make this purpose viable. And so we read in verse 1, he entered Jericho, and was passing through. Passing through where? To Jerusalem. But because Jesus is on mission and he's going to fulfill this purpose, doesn't mean he's quit interacting with people. And we're going to pick up on one of these 
human interaction starting at verse 2. There was a man called by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and he was rich. A couple things to note there. He was a tax collector. That means he was working for the Romans. See, Israel was an occupied territory and they were occupied by the Romans. And as a Jewish person, Zacchaeus was working for them, collecting money. In fact, we have reason to believe from this that he was a a, a manager, a chief tax collector. And it says he was rich. Uh, Many of these tax collectors uh, lined their pockets by overcharging people. And, And who wanted to argue with Roman authority? So they were despised. They were hated. They were loathed by the Jewish people. You know, as a, a kid, I, I sold Boy Scout candy, and I sold Little League baseball candy, and I sold Little League football candy. And so when somebody comes knocking at my door selling something, I'm an easy mark. I always buy, because I so many times as a kid, I just can't say no. But you know, if somebody came selling candies or cookies or whatever, and they were selling for something like ISIS, I would have no problem turning them down. Somebody that's in opposition to our country. I share this example. And that's how the, 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 the people feel about Zacchaeus. And we get a fuller understanding of Zacchaeus' social standing in verse 3. Here's what it says. Zacchaeus was trying to see who Jesus was and what is Unable because of the crowd, for he was small in stature. Uh, scholars are almost uh, unanimous in that small in stature has a, has a dual meaning. Certainly it, it referred to his physical size. But it also had to do with his social presence. He was looked down on. He had no social standing. He was on the margin. And with this crowd that was gathered, almost like a parade, and, and Zac- Zacchaeus wanted to get in and see it. These people weren't going to let him in. So what does Zacchaeus do? Well, verse 4. So he ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree in order to see him. For he was about to pass through that way. We see kids climb trees, do we? we? We understand that. But a grown man climbing a tree? Uh, That looks a little silly, doesn't it? Well, Zacchaeus is looking silly here. Why? Because he's desperate. Why? He wants to see and know Jesus. Where did he get the idea that, that Jesus would want to have anything to do with him? Well, early in Jesus' public ministry... Uh, Jesus called a man who was a tax collector, and his name was Matthew, he became one of his disciples. He wrote our first gospel. And man, was that a crisis, was that a deal with the religious leaders. And in fact, not only does he call him, but he gets with Matthew's friends and, and he dines with them. And the critique of Jesus, he's a friend of tax collectors and sinners. So word has gotten out, and Zacchaeus is thinking, you know, nobody else will have anything to do with me. Maybe. maybe. Jesus, so, so he's desperate. He rolls the dice. He takes a chance. And he climbs a tree that he might see and know Jesus. What happens? Verse 5. When Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said, man, what are you doing? No, no, no. That's not what it said. He looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come today. For today, now catch this, I must stay at your house. Really? Really? You must stay? Well, what, what's, help, help me out, Jesus. What's, what's the urgency? Why must you stay? you got a whole crowd here. Why must you stay with Zacchaeus? Jesus is the uh, eternal son of God. So no surprise, he reflects the character of God. And if you read your Old Testament, you will see that God told Israel, you take care of the vulnerable. You take care of the widow. You take care of the orphan. And oh, by the way, farmers, when when you harvest your field, you glean, which means you leave the edge unharvested. Why? So the poor have something to eat. And he set up a whole system of religious holidays that people who were in debt could be freed from their debt. Jesus 
He's the eternal Son of God. And, and his public ministry reflected he cared about people on the margin. So, so what's Zacchaeus' reaction? It's verse 6. It says, he hurried and came down and received him, catch this, gladly. Why was Zacchaeus so glad? Because see, Zacchaeus was living in a religious system where he had no chance. No chance. It was performance-based acceptance. The Pharisees had taken the Old Testament and they had added 640 precepts. And if you kept the rules, you were in. And the degree to which you kept the rules or failed to, keep, failed to keep the rules was the degree to which you were out. And Zacchaeus was at the back of the pack. He had no chance. Until Jesus came along. Jesus took that performance-based acceptance and he turned it upside down. And he talked about grace-based acceptance. Not based on your performance, but based on the mercy and forgiveness of God offered through Jesus. Wasn't that good news? Somebody on the margin, somebody with no chance, has chance it, what, what, shouldn't we celebrate that? That wasn't the crowd's reaction. Look at verse 7. When they saw it, they, the crowd, all began to grumble saying, he has gone to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. Why would he do that? There are people who've been a lot better. They've been, I mean, there's, 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 there's a couple of Pharisees in here, and there's some people who gave some money to the synagogue, and, and, and they've been much better. Why is, of all the people, why is Jesus picking Zacchaeus? Yeah. Jesus has a different system than they do. So how does Zacchaeus respond? Verse 8. Zacchaeus stopped and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, half of my possessions I will give to the poor. And if I've defrauded anyone of anything, I will give back four times as much. So let me put this in context. In, in Jesus' day, if, if you were generous, you gave 20% of your possessions to the poor. Zacchaeus saying, I'm going to give 50%. If you defrauded somebody and you were caught, the law said you had to give 20% more back. So if I took you for $10, the law said I had to pay you back 12, 20% more. Zacchaeus is saying, no, no, I'm going to go beyond that. I'm going I'm to do 400%. So if I took you for 10 bucks, I'm going to pay you 40. <laughs> what happened with Zacchaeus? Remember, this is a guy who made his living by abusing power. You know, I remember when I was in Russia, I was in Siberia, and my girlfriend and then my fiancé was in Almaty, Kazakhstan, and it was a 40-hour train ride between the two. And when I get on the train, I'd pay for my ticket, and as a foreigner, I had to pay more, and the conductor would come through, and he would always charge me a little bit more because I was a foreigner. I didn't have any recourse. Now, trust me, I, I didn't want to be put out in the train. It was a frozen tundra. It was remote. I'm pretty sure Verizon didn't get out there. I'm sure Uber or Lyft didn't get out there. I just, I'll just pay what amounted to be about five bucks. But there was a guy abusing power, taking advantage of somebody who was vulnerable. There weren't any Americans to plead my case. That is how Zacchaeus made his living. But all of a sudden, he said, I'm done abusing power. I'm going to take what I give and, and give it back to the people that I abused. What happened? He met Jesus. That's what happened. And he took on the character of his Savior. You know, I, I'm just wondering, many of us, including me, and some of you watching, we've, we've been following Jesus a while. Would people connect us with Jesus? Well, they say, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I get it. Yeah, you've taken on Jesus' character. Remember, at 20 years old, I went back and saw a family that I hadn't seen in years. And my dad's youngest sister, my aunt, said, oh, you remind me of your father. The way you look, your manners. Well, that would make sense, wouldn't it? I've been in his house for 18 years. We've been following Jesus a while. Can, can people connect us? 
our concern for the vulnerable, because let me tell you, in this coronavirus, season of coronavirus, we've got the, the vulnerable all around us. Would people connect us with Jesus? Well, verse 9, we get Jesus' synopsis of what happened. He said, verse 9, and Jesus said to him today, salvation has come to this house because he too is a son of Abraham. Zacchaeus is, is reconnected with God. Man, a lot's gone on in a short time, isn't it? it, it just, just a moment ago, it's like this guy is, is on the margin and nobody will give him a time of day and, and the religious community thinks, you're out, buddy, you're, you're way out. And now he's, Jesus said, I, I, I must see you. And, and all of a sudden, he's connected with God and his character has changed. How, how? How did this all happen? Well, verse 10. For, this is Jesus speaking, the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. This soul, Zacchaeus, was disconnected from God. And now he's connected and, and you can see it in the way he's living. That was Jesus' purpose. And that's our purpose. See, we're, we're asking this question in this time when, when things are changing and church is different and what's it going to look like? The, the purpose hasn't changed. It, it's, it's been the same for 2,000 years and it'll be another 2,000 years if Jesus doesn't come back. What's Jesus' purpose for us individually? And collectively, we're to seek to connect disconnected people with God. We are to seek to connect disconnected people with God. Uh, in verse 10, Jesus said, I, I, I've come to seek and to save that which was lost. Uh, well, who are the lost? Well, actually, all of us are. Because God created us to be in a relationship with him. And by nature, we push back and we go our own way. And we think, oh, no big deal. Yeah, it's a big deal to God. We're disconnected from God. Like many of you, our, our, our family has a, a cell plan and we have a certain amount of data we get. And so I tell the boys, make sure when you're on that you're going through Wi-Fi. But sometimes you'll be in a place and, and Wi-Fi will drop and, and without knowing it, you're disconnected and you're using data. I think we've all had that experience. Well, that's where our culture is with God. They're disconnected and they don't even know it. The problem is, it's not data that they're losing. <laughs> it's their life that's slipping away. And see, the gospel says, Jesus came and lived the life we were supposed to live. Perfect submission to the Father right up to the point he died on the cross. And many would look at Easter, the first Easter, and say, that was mob rule, things got out of control. God was absolutely in control. That, that, that was planned from eternity past. He died on the cross for our sin and rose again three days later to pay the penalty for our rebellion that we could be reconnected with God. And that's our purpose. That's why we continue to go forward with church online and that's why we continue to do Zoom groups and all this stuff and that because that purpose hasn't changed. We're about reconnecting disconnected people with God. Now maybe some of you are, are watching this and, and you're not sure where you stand. And you'd say to me, you know Andy, there is some stuff in my background if you knew and, and you know what, I, I don't need to know but I need you to know that God knows And if you're willing to follow him, he would say you're a, a must-see. Remember he said with Zacchaeus, I must stay. You're, you're a must-see person. Remember we had one of these networks had must-see TV. Well, you're a, a, a must-see person. If you're willing to confess your sin, your rebellion to God, and to receive him to begin to follow, and would you say, God, would you do a work in my life like, like you've done in Zacchaeus? Not because of your performance, but because of God's grace, you will be reconnected through Jesus. See, I went to college thinking it was, it was my performance and I got involved in a dorm Bible study and, and this verse messed me up. For by grace you've been saved through faith and then this phrase, not as a result of works, 
It's not what you've done. It's what you do with God's offer of grace and mercy in Jesus Christ. Now, conversely, some of you may be sitting and thinking, yeah, I, I, I'm pretty good. Yeah, I, I'm okay. That's a dangerous position because the religious leaders thought they were okay and they rejected Jesus' offer and in fact, they ended up killing him because he threatened them. Uh, Jesus had his greatest conflict, not with the sinners, but with the religious leaders. In fact, at one point, he called them whitewashed tombs. See, Jesus missed the Carnegie course on how to win friends and influence people. But he said, you're clean on the outside and you're, you're dead on the inside. You've got all the right actions, but inside, you're using people and you're doing your own thing. And all of us are in need of the grace of God. And I think that message is particularly poignant in this time of Easter. Next week, I'm going to be talking about the first Easter Sunday. And Jesus told his followers he was going to be crucified and he would resurrect. And and yet, uh, on the first Sunday morning, they were locked up in fear. Literally, the disciples were in a room, afraid to come out. And it was some women who ventured out and they saw the empty tomb. And the angel said, he's not here, he's risen. And initially, they didn't do anything because Mark 16, 8 says they were afraid. And honestly, our our world and our country is living in a great time of fear. Everything we know is being taken away from us. And how does it end? When does it end? How does it play out? We don't know. And it's a horrible thing to be living in fear. These first followers of Jesus on that first Easter Sunday morning were were in fear, but they didn't stay in fear. In fact, they were bold people, and I want to talk about that next week. But you've got neighbors, you've got friends, you've got coworkers. Would you shoot them the link of our service? Would you call them and say, let me give you North Point's website. Let me invite you to invest 50 minutes or 60 minutes next Easter Sunday to watch. I think it'll be worth your while. The dude's going to talk about fear and how to deal with it. Why would you do that? Because that's Jesus' purpose for us. And that hasn't changed, even in this season of coronavirus. See, one of the core values we have at North Point is that people matter to God, and we see it here with Jesus. And people do matter to God, and we want to reach out. (laughs) You know, we've talked about Zacchaeus being vulnerable, but I would suggest the coronavirus has made us aware that we're all vulnerable. Do you see the prime minister of Britain's got it? You see the the president of uh, Brazil has got it? I'm sure they have Secret Service detachments guarding them, but but the coronavirus gets right by the Secret Service. And the coronavirus gets right into gated communities. And the coronavirus gets everywhere. There's no stopping it. We are vulnerable. You say, yeah, Andy, some are more vulnerable than others. I agree with you. But every one of us is a vulnerable people. We're safe. Where's, Where's a stable place? I'll tell you where a stable place is. It's God. Well, can you promise me this outcome? No, 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 I can't, but I can promise you God's in control. And the way you get there is through the grace of God offered in Jesus Christ. Will you make that offer? Will you make that invitation to your friends, your neighbors, and your coworkers for next Sunday to check out our Easter service? If you've seen me preach, you know we have two boys. And I think it was uh, 12 years ago this spring, our our youngest boy was riding his bike. It was a new bike, and he was getting used to it. And uh, he fell. And if you're a parent, you know how this goes. He instinctively reached down to break his fall with his arm. And what happened? Well, he broke that arm. This happened all while I was gone. So when I got back to our home, I had some neighbors saying, hey, Hope has taken both boys to, they went to the urgent care, and by the time I called her, they're at the hospital because the urgent care said, you know, we, we really can't deal with this, and they pushed them on. And, and so it, we moved through the emergency room at a, at a reasonably good pace, but still, this was not a life-threatening injury, so, so he wasn't expedited. So at some point, Hope says, Annie, why don't I take Chris home, and uh, you stay, and I thought, you bet I'll stay. Because as a parent, man, I felt protective of my little boy. And so I, I, I met with the physician's assistant, and he showed me an x-ray. 
And he said, you see here, the, the, the arm is broken and it's displaced. And I thought, yeah, yeah, it is. No question. He said, we, before we put that on a cast, we, we need to set that and put it back in place. And that's going to be a matter of hooking some weights up to his arm, and we suggest we put him out to do that, and we suggest, he was looking at me, that, that you not watch that process. So I thought, you know what, I, I think you're right. I'm going to put my full trust in this physician's assistant who was a bone specialist who had done this. I'm going to trust you to reset my son's arm because you can do something I can't do, but I desperately want it to happen. And so we did, and they did their thing, and, and Drew was coming out of it, and, and he came back out, and he had showed me the, the x-ray, and he said, look, the, the arm's perfectly set. Now we're going to cast it, and we're going to let it heal. And for the last 12 or 13 years, my son's arm has been fine. I needed that PA to do something I couldn't do for myself. Do you understand? We're displaced. We're disconnected in our relationship with God. And it's something that only Jesus can fix. But here's where my illustration breaks down. They put my son out and, and he didn't feel any of the pain. Jesus bore the pain. He bore the sin of the world. Why? That disconnected people could be connected with God. Would we take advantage of this season, of this Easter season, to invite people to reconnect with God. That's the purpose we got. That's why we're working hard at live streaming, all this stuff. Because no matter what's going on, the purpose of the church still holds. Would we be people that embrace that purpose? Let me pray. Our Father in heaven, uh, Jesus has made it clear. We are to join him in seeking and saving the lost. People are disconnected. People are displaced. People are broken. And like that PA, you can do something that we can't do. You can reconnect. You can set perfectly back in place that which was broken. Lord, would we point people to Jesus that they may be reconnected with you. I pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Hey, it's the first Sunday of the month, and typically we celebrate communion. Now, these are unique times, unprecedented times, but, but we don't want to give up on that practice. So here's what I'm going to ask you to do. We're going to do it virtually. Would you take a minute and get something to represent the body and blood of Jesus? If you need to pause this, feel free to do it. Just so you know, I'm using part of uh, the crust from my sandwich for the body and the Diet Coke I had for for lunch. So go ahead and pause this and then we'll come back and celebrate communion together. So we've come to remember this Jesus whose body was broken and blood was shed and we be, could be reconnected with God. Whenever there's a time that we didn't know we're connected with God, this is it. So Paul wrote of this memorial in 1 Corinthians 11 verse 23. He said, for I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, in the night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. I invite you to take and eat. Lord Jesus, we give thanks for your body broken for us that we could be connected with you. Thank you for that sacrifice. It's your name we pray. Amen. Paul continued writing in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 25. It says, in the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. I invite you to take and drink. Jesus, we thank you for your blood. 
shed for us that we could be made clean. Thank you for the hope of a connection with you that lasts from now into eternity. And it's because of you we can offer this prayer. Amen. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Yes, we live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you, oh, we live for you, holy, holy, there is no one like you, there is none besides you, open up my eyes.
peace.